The annual conference of the Boao Forum for Asia has officially opened in southern China's Hainan province. We bring you this special coverage from our studio in the host town of Boao. The theme of this year's event is World in COVID-19 and Beyond, Working Together for Global Development and a Shared Future. The annual conference will focus on many topics including green development and international solidarity and cooperation. Chinese President Xi Jinping addressed the opening ceremony by video link Thursday morning. For more on that, let's cross live to my colleague Gas in Hainan. Hello there. Hi, Pandang. Thank you for the introduction. We are coming to you live from our studio in Boa, Hainan province. I'm your host, Kasturi Manikam. Now, delegates from governments, businesses, academia and media across the world are gathering both in person and online to discuss the post-pandemic development agenda for Asia and the world. This year's BOA Forum for Asia highlights the factors of green and smart, both reflected in transportation, meeting services and accommodation. Local officials say about 300 of the service vehicles are new energy vehicles with more than 140 40 charging piles built in and around the hotels in the core area of the event. A green power trading system has also been established for the first time. The system will ensure 100% green power supply for the hotel venues. Now, as Pandang just said, Chinese President Xi Jinping has delivered a keynote speech via video link at the opening ceremony here in Boao. She called for greater confidence as human history faces a more difficult time. Our reporter Dong Xue has more. Chinese President Xi Jinping says China will continue to push for multilateralism and peaceful cooperation among Asian countries. Delivering the opening remarks via video link, this is President Xi's sixth address at the annual Boao Forum for Asia series. President Xi says the world is still facing uncertainties brought by the COVID-19 pandemic and that more than ever we must work together. China has provided more than 2 billion doses of vaccines to more than 120 countries and regions and she says China will keep doing so to narrow the immunization gap. He also says China is committed to furthering opening up, boosting economic recovery and promoting Asian unity. President Xi stresses that security is a prerequisite for development and humankind is an indivisible community of security and that a Cold War mentality can only undermine the framework of global peace. The president says hegemonism and power politics can only harm world peace and that confrontation among blocs can only exacerbate 21st century security challenges. To contribute, she says China is ready to put forward global security initiatives initiatives jointly safeguard world peace, respect the territorial integrity of all countries, and uphold the UN's opposition to unilateralism through dialogue and consultation. He says China opposes unilateral sanctions and long-arm jurisdiction. High-profile officials, including Chinese Vice Premier Han Zheng, also attended the forum virtually, as well as heads of state from Israel, Mongolia, Nepal, the Philippines, and managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Discussions at the forum encompass topics from digital currencies, carbon neutrality, as well as the economic outlook for a post-pandemic world. Built as the Asian version of the World Economic Forum, the event has become an increasingly influential platform to witness China's opening up, integration to Asia, as well as the global community. Dong Xue, CGTN, Boao, Hainan Province. I want to bring in our reporter, Dongxie herself, who's joining me now here in Boao. Now, Dongxie, we just heard the highlights of President Xi's speech in your report. Uh, what else do you have on his speech? And also, what can we expect from uh, today's agenda? Yes, Gus, as you mentioned, the 2022 Boao Forum for Asia has, uh, has opened up this morning with Chinese President Xi Jinping delivered a keynote speech via video link calling for multilateralism as well as embracing openness and cooperation among, specifically among Asian countries. Well, uh, high profile, high profile head, head of states, you know, including 
the Chinese Vice Premier Han Zheng and the heads of state from Israel, Mongolia, Nepal and the Philippines and the managing director of the International Monetary Fund are also attended the, uh, the forum online and uh, delivered their remarks as well. Well, this is President Xi's sixth address at the forum with the COVID-19 still affecting the world. This year's theme is working together for a global development and a shared future. Well, on day one, the annual meeting released two key thought leadership products. One is a flagship study on tracking Asia's green transition and policy recommendations to push the environmentally responsible agenda forward. And the other one is a report on Asia's economic outlook and integration. Well, personally, I also moderated one discussion yesterday on what I called the common prosperity. Well, the idea is not new here in China. It's about narrowing the wealth gap, a priority set up in the 1950s by Chairman Mao Zedong and reiterated in the 1980s by Deng Xiaoping, credited with the modernizing China's economy, is now emphasized again by President Xi Jinping and has emerged as one of the most important concepts guiding China's policymaking over the past half year. Well, today, looking forward, attendees are will will be also you know discussing on green economy, you know carbon neutrality, digital currencies, and of course the global cooperation. Economically recovering from the pandemic remains the most significant topic at this forum. A report released earlier by the forum says Asia remains a pivotal driving force behind global economic growth. The fight against COVID-19 and getting economics back up and running has strongly boosted the recovery of the world trade. In 2022, the Asian economy will still be in the process of recovery, but the growth rate may be moderate. The IMF suggested that the weight, weight real GDP growth is expected to be 5.2 percent, slightly lower than in 2021. Boal's flagship report seems not so optimistic after considering all the growing negative factors, as it indicates that the Asian economic growth in 2022 is likely to be lower than what the IMF has forecasted. Well, actually, the IMF has already said in April that because of the crisis between Russia and Ukraine, it will lower its global economic growth forecast for 2022 to reflect the impact. Guess. Don't see a lot of key messages coming out of there. Thank you for the extensive uh, report there. Now, let's speak to Mr. Li Yong, Senior Fellow at the China Association of International Trade. Uh, Mr. Li, thank you for joining our program. Now, President Xi proposed a global security initiative. What's your understanding of that proposal? I think this is a uh, China's holistic view of the uh, security and the peace, how to achieve it. And uh, Xi Jinping actually pointed out uh, the problems, the misconception, misperception of security that the world need to be avoided uh, to avoid, for example, uh, Cold War mentality, uh, unilateralism, double standards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this, uh, I think, put forward China's position in terms of uh, dealing a kind of a balanced relationship between security and peace. Back to you. Now, and what does this mean for the international community? Um, I think basically uh, this can be viewed as a call for the uh, uh, for the world to work together to establish uh, principles, uh, for example, uh, to, for, to rally around the leadership of the United Nations uh, to adhere to the uh, uh, United Charters and to pursue solutions to conflicts and problems through dialogue and consultations. So these are the principles that need to be recognized and implemented right now. I, particularly, we are facing uh, some of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, security and the peace problems uh, in uh, Ukraine. And, uh, you know, uh, we need to resolve those issues, you know, uh, without any uh, bias or prejudice or whatever, uh, impartiality. We need to deal with, you know, a kind of a balanced view and we need to push uh, for uh, the, per uh, the peace process uh, with those principles being um, advocated by uh, President Xi Jinping. 
Now, I just want to pick up on what you just said. The President Xi also said it's particularly important for major countries to lead by example, and he quoted, in honoring equality, cooperation, good faith, and the rule of law. How do you see these responsibilities uh, of major countries? You know, those major countries have great influence, you know, not just politically, geopolitically, also geo-economically. Uh, and, uh, you know, they are having a big impact. If they don't really, uh, you know, behave in ways compatible with what they have been advocating, you know, that that is not going to lead the world in the right direction. So they need to set an example or walk the talk and uh, make the world that, but to believe that they are using their economic, no, economic and political influence to, for the global good, rather than you know leading to leading the world into a kind of undesired direction. So I think that's the important part of the major country, you know, to set an example in front of the world to make sure that the world you know, is going to the right direction to deal with, especially the, uh, you know, the potential crisis. Back to you. Now, President Xi also talked about the fundamentals of the Chinese uh, economy. As he puts it, he talks about strong resilience, enormous potential, a vast room for maneuvering and long-term stability. So how do you see China's role in promoting global economy? Um, I think, you know, China can, can play multiple roles. The first is uh, China is going to be a stabilizer of the uh, world economy, especially uh, amid the headwinds of, uh, of global economic challenges. And what China has been doing to stabilize domestic economy is, as, as a fact, uh, is in fact, an effort also to stabilize the global uh, economic relations, particularly uh, the stabilization of, uh, of uh, global supply chain, uh, in which China plays a crit critical role. And the second uh, role I think uh, uh, China can play is a, an important contributor to the global economic growth. If China's uh, economy keeps growing, and that is going to contribute to the global economic growth, uh, for sure, and China will also contribute to the uh, uh, global agenda, uh, for example, green de development and so on. So this is the uh, the uh, a very critical, I think, you know, uh, in in uh, in the in, uh, in, uh, for the rest of the year and for the years to come. And uh, thirdly, I think China is also a partner. Uh, for the world to work together to deal with uh, global economic challenges and also the pot potential crisis. Back to you. Mr. Mr. Lee, thank you for your time. A lot to think about. Thank you for those perspectives. Now, among the major topics in this year's BOA Forum for Asia is carbon neutrality. Hainan province, surrounded by water, hopes to harness the power of the ocean in its carbon capture efforts. Gao Ang reports. With a sea area of 2 million square kilometers, rich marine ecosystems, and great biodiversity, Hainan province hopes to use that to help achieve carbon neutrality. Carbon stored in coastal and marine ecosystem is called blue carbon. UNESCO's Intergovernmental Oceanographic Committee says these ecosystems can capture up to four times more carbon than forests. And that means they have a key role to play in tackling the climate emergency. In February this year, the province unveiled an international blue carbon research center. The center's goal is to create an open international and professional research platform. Thus, the province has positioned the center in three aspects, carrying out research on blue carbon technology and policy, promoting pilot demonstrations of blue carbon, and promoting international exchanges and cooperation. China has a territorial sea area of about 4.7 million square kilometers. Professor Zhang Xiliang of Tsinghua University says, 
reducing emissions and increasing carbon removal are key to achieving carbon neutrality. But he says they have different roles at different times. Reducing carbon emissions tends towards progressively increasing marginal costs and decreasing effects. It is relatively good to reduce emissions now because its cost is low. But to a certain extent, for example, when the emissions are reduced to more than 80 percent, it is difficult to reduce another two billion tons. That's when blue carbon can help with carbon removal. In March this year. An international carbon emission trading center was approved for Hainan. Its aim to open up financial markets and fuel China's efforts towards a goal of carbon neutrality. Gao Wang, CGTN, Boao, Hainan Province. In Thailand, one of the world's largest hydro floating solar hybrid projects has started commercial operation. It's in line with Bangkok's goal to increase the share of renewables in energy consumption to 35% by 2037. Built by B. Grimm Power and China Energy Corporation, the project is expected to deliver up to 45 megawatts of power to Thailand's national grid. Dusita Sakao reports. It's been fittingly coined the Emerald Triangle. The magnificent green landscape spills over the borders of Laos and Cambodia. Tradition and culture run deep in this far eastern Thai province. Grandma waking up before dawn preparing food for saffron road monks. Farmers on their fields keeping the tradition of rice farming alive. Livestock roaming along the road as cars maneuver. In Obon Rajathani, the soul of this province keeps one foot in the past as the other steps firmly into the future. From the water's edge, the newest piece of Thailand's renewable energy future is just a shimmer in the distance, difficult to appreciate from afar. But zoom in a little closer. A vast array of floating solar panels spanning an area equivalent to 70 football fields with the capacity to generate 45 megawatts of clean electricity. This facility, almost 700 kilometers east of Bangkok, is said to be the world's largest hydro-floating solar hybrid system. It combines two methods of generating electricity. While these 145,000 solar panels harness power from the sun during the day, there are also three turbines converting energy from flowing water at night. This is not just a symbol of Thailand's drive towards clean energy. This is just the beginning. Fifteen similar projects in all of the country's nine major reservoirs are in the pipelines in an effort to bring Thailand closer to the goal of net zero emissions and become a sustainable low-carbon society. But there's still a long way to go. Thailand's energy grids continue to rely heavily on fossil fuels, making up approximately 80 percent of the country's power, while only around 17 percent comes from renewable sources. Still, projects like this show that progress is being made. We are thrilled that Thailand has taken this big step to enhance our energy security. In the future, our country's solar projects could have the capacity to generate up to 5,000 megawatts in the next 20 to 30 years, so we will reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. This once modest town is now buzzing with energy. New souvenir shops, tourist buses and rafting areas are stimulating tourism, creating jobs and generating income for a local community hard hit by the pandemic. COVID was devastating for us. It was hard to get financial aid and our income plummeted. So I and this whole community are grateful for this solar farm project. We see significant changes in people's lives, as well as the rapid economic growth in our province. And amid the general gloom of climate change and a global energy crisis, reminding us that oil will inevitably one day run out, the sun will keep on shining over Ubon Rajatani, and not just here, but elsewhere too. Lucita Sao Gao, CGTN, Ubon Rajatani, Thailand. Another highlight at the Boa Forum is trends and opportunities in the Asian intellectual property sector. I want to discuss that with Mr. Yu Xiang. He is the director of the Sino-European Institute of Intellectual Property from Hua Chong University of Science and Technology. He is also the vice president of Hubei Normal University. Mr. Yu, thank you. Good to have you here with thank us. Thank you. Now, first of all, over 54% of all international patent applications last year came from Asia. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, how can we strengthen cooperation and improve efficiency in cross regional IP protection? Yes. The global response to COVID-19 has further demonstrated that the all countries and the peoples is interdependent, the destiny of all countries and the peoples. Asian countries are close neighbors, and there is greater needs to do cooperative, green, and innovative cooperation among all countries. Based on the good development of innovation and the patent application in Asia, I believe the Asian countries should further strengthen IP cooperation. For example, in the following three aspects. Firstly, expanding cooperation in IP protection. For example, expanding patent prosecution highway PPH cooperation. Patent prosecution highway PPH uh, is an uh, initiative for providing accelerated patent examination procedures by sharing information between patent offices. It also permits each participating patent office to benefit from the work previously done by the other patent office with the goal of reducing examination workload and improving patent quality. Since 2011, the Chinese National IP Administration has already signed PPH cooperation agreement with other patent offices in 27 other countries, including five Asia countries. Certainly, the CINIPA has also signed a PPH cooperation agreement with European Patent Office, which has 38 member countries, and also signed cooperation agreement with the Eurasia Patent Office, which has eight member countries. I believe more Asia countries could try to create conditions for signing PPH cooperation with other Asian countries by coordination of patent system, examination standards, examination quality, and so on, so as to achieve mutual benefit and win-win cooperation. Secondly, promoting implementation of IP. For example, the newly amended Chinese patent law has added an open license system. And the patent law or other relevant legislation in the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Thailand, Russia, Poland, etc., also provide us for a similar open license system. This is of great help to simplify the patent licensing negotiation and therefore to improve, Im, uh, promote the implementation of patented technology. And certainly, adopting green patent system. In his speech at the opening ceremony, ceremony of Boao Forum 2021, President Xi Jinping called for green development as the underpinning of Belt and Road Corporation. Green and sustainable development is crucial for Asia and the world at large. The green patent system encourages innovation in the field of green technologies by formulating and implementing preferential policy, politics, policies for patent applications of green technologies. The World Intellectual Property Organization has also a dedicated WIPO Green project. Since 2009, the United Kingdom, the United States, South Korea, Japan, Israel, Australia, Canada, China, Brazil, and some other countries have successively formulated similar green patent intent incentive policies to encourage innovation in the field, including but not limited to the clean and renewable energy and environmental protection, as well as the energy uh, conservation and carbon reduction. Through accelerated examination and phase reduction for patent application of green technology. And I think in the near future, technologies for controlling pandemics such as COVID-19 should also be inclusive and encouraged similarly. So Mr. Yu, let me just ask you, what kind of uh, IP opportunities and risks 
uh, will enterprise face when having to deal with uh, new technologies, new business models and new trends? Yes, enterprises should grasp new opportunities and avoid new risks in IP fields. For example, the development and utilization of green technology or technologies for public health security are in line with the national policies. Therefore, we are usher in new opportunities. Artificial intelligence related in innovation, uh, as well as the, has also wide, wide range of the usage. Therefore, also have new opportunities. However, the AI related invention, if uh, violating the security or fairness or ethics, will face new risks, they therefore need to be controlled. All right. Thank you. Mr. Yu, thank you for coming on the show mm -hmm. and uh, speaking to us. Thank, thank you, you for your time. Thank you very much to have me. Pandang, several key messages coming out of BOA this year, but I'm afraid we just have to leave it here for now. I'll bring you more highlights uh, tomorrow, same time.